This is Beekeeper Confidential, a show about the curious lives of bees and their beekeepers. I'm your host, Mandy Shaw. I had the pleasure of spending some more time with Julia Mahood, a Georgia master beekeeper that we spoke with a few months back. This interview was recorded on March 30th, just at the beginning of the quarantine here in the U.S., before we realized the extent of our social and physical confinement. I only went back and listened to this a week ago to get it ready to publish, and I just want to say how timely this conversation and topic felt. It's given me pause to really be grateful for the privileges that I have in my life, and I hope that you get that feeling as well. Yeah, same. <laughs> it's crazy. I've um, sequestered myself in my messy studio, so I hope you can't see anything. I'm in my studio too. I've got my um, my iron right here and my sewing machine in the background. <laughs> it's really the only quiet place in my house because the both my boys are home. They're nine and ten, and they're in there bickering. So. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. My um. My boys are home too, but they're 20 and 23 and they're not bickering that much. But, you know, we raise the kids in this house, but it's just not a big house. And all of a sudden going from two to four is like, well, we have no room and no privacy and that's okay. Yeah. I'm so happy to have them home. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you back today. We're going to talk about your work with the Women's Prison Program. Yes. Well, I really appreciate you having me on before because it's been great to just get that, get the word out. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, and I really hope that you'll see your map light up with new DCAs everywhere. Yeah, people, people are registering, so that's really exciting. Well, um, a little background, the beekeeping, the prison beekeeping program in Georgia started in 2015 in um, Smith State Prison, which is a men's prison in Georgia, and they had an inmate who had been a beekeeper on the outside, and he wanted to teach a beekeeping class, and they said, the administration said, sure. And they came to the Georgia Beekeepers Association to ask for some financial support with the, the equipment. And the president at the time, his name is Bear Kelly, who's just a great person and a very expansive um, person for the club, kind of embraced it. And um, they arranged for Brushy Mountain, which they're no longer in business anymore, but I miss Brushy. Um, they donated all the equipment to get started. And then the GBA paid for the shipping. And then GBA, um, got some volunteers together to, to help teach. And so it went so well that that prison then put beekeeping into their budget and a lot of the other prisons wanted to have programs. And I told Bear at the time, if there's ever a women's prison who wants a program that I would just love to do it because I've just always been interested in um, prison life. I read a book a long time ago about what prison was like for women and it's very different. Um, obviously women have different needs in every respect, physically and socially. But prisons are really set up for men because most incarcerated individuals are male. And so it's, it's just interesting and, um, and kind of difficult for women to, uh, you know, to be in that environment. So I've read a little bit about it and I was just interested. So Lee Arendale, which is the largest women's prison in the state of Georgia, they have about 1500 inmates. Um, wow. They wanted to start a program and it's, it's a maximum security facility. They do, you know, have the whole spectrum and they have, they even have some juvenile um, girls there who, uh, but they also ha house the death row for women. There's only one woman on death row right now. But um, so it's kind of the, runs the whole gamut um, and it's a big compound and they have a lot of um, programs. So the warden at the time was um, really wanted to make it happen. And so um, we started with three volunteers. One quickly had to drop out because she had some other stuff going on. But so I've been teaching with Virginia Webb since 2016. Virginia is an amazing master beekeeper. She's just a force in the bee world. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she's, um, she's done so many things. So it's been, um, it's been amazing to work with her. And then last year we recruited a new volunteer, David Holloman, who's been just a real joy to, um, to work with too. So we're, we're very well supported in terms of volunteers. The way, so there are, I'm not really sure right now because of the whole 
COVID thing, how many programs are active. I mean, I haven't been able to go since um, early March because they're obviously not letting in any non-essential employees, which yeah. is understandable and they need to do that because yeah. you can't even imagine. But we had about seven prisons with programs um, at the end of last year. And um, Lee Arendelle's the only women's prison. So my other little volunteer job with GBA is to help um, prisons who want to start a program get volunteers. Mm -hmm. and they really need a volunteer to come in and sort of teach at least the first class. And the, the way that the original class at Smith was structured, they had um, at the end of the season, they, uh, the University of Georgia came in and certified the beekeepers, administered the testing. And then the idea is that then the certified um, inmates can start teaching going forward. And I think that's worked in some of the prisons, but um, I, at Arendelle, after the first, so we taught, the first year we actually taught twice a week for this bee season. Wow. And they certified at the end of the season. And then the plan was to just come monthly and kind of check on them. But that really was not enough for them because they, and we intentionally made up the first class of people who were, um, going to uh, some people who would be released within a year, a few years. And we had a f quite a few lifers thinking that they could stick around and keep teaching and keep, um, you know, have that experience to help the program. Um, but it's hard in prison to give anyone authority, you know, so the people who had experience, we, if you can't say she's in charge if she's an inmate, because it just creates all kinds of dissension. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I was told early on that um, there's not a lot of violence in women's prisons, but there's just a whole lot of emotional stuff, like a, lots and lots of drama. And man, it is really true. <laughs> but um, so there's some jealousy among some of the um, beekeepers. And so how many people are you allowed to have in each each course or each semester that you're running the classes? So um, we have about 20, I think. Start, I think the first class we started with 24, but a lot of people, you know, some people get in, it, it's a, um, first I should say that very first class, we, there were 200 people who were interested and I came and did like a little just introductory, this is what beekeeping is, seminar for the 200 people who were interested and it was kind of funny because the warden at the time said, you know, do you think you could do two presentations? Because there are certain populations we can't have in the room at the same time. <laughs> and I was wow. like, okay. <laughs> Um, so I did these presentations and then from there, I think, you know, 150 had showed up and signed up and wanted to do, wanted to do the course. So the deputy warning care and treatment basically handpicked the first class. And so can't be in beekeeping if you've had a, um, like a disciplinary incident in the last six months. So you have to be well behaved. You're not going to have anybody in there. That's a danger of, you know, cause you have to work with hive tools and smokers and stuff. So it's a privilege to be in beekeeping and they know it. Um, but even that said, sometimes people get in and it's just not what they expected. And there, you know, we've had people get in and they really just kind of wanted a, um, the excuse to get out of their dorms and they just never showed up for class. So, and then people will get transferred. We have no control over that. Um, we've had a few people get released early, even though we kind of asked to not have them put anybody in the class that might be eligible for early release. One year we ended up with only like three people at the end of the season. Oh my um, goodness. Real bummer because, you know, that's, they kind of had to wait till the next year to get certified. And um, so I keep every year, I'm like, we need at least 15 new people. Um, but we get between 10 and 15 new, and then there's some attrition. So I think right now we have maybe 20 people on the, on the roll and that's uh -huh. the, the old people and the new. But how, um, uh, how, like, what kind of changes are you seeing in the participants from when they join the program and for the ones that do end up following through and staying in for the entire time? How is that having an impact on their day to day lives and their outlook on the future? That's a great question, because a lot of people focus on recidivism for prison programming. And they're like the whole, you know, the bottom line is, do they come back? But that's really not the bottom line at all, because being in prison is like really, really boring. That's what I've learned. There's just not much to do. And most of the jobs, like if you get a job in prison, um, it's just, you don't, you can't get paid for it legally. So it, you, you can get points that makes your record look good, but it's really just because they're bored and they're, 
they're all sort of menial labor jobs, right? So being in a class is, is a privilege and they do have a vocational school there. They have, um, they have a dog program, they have small engine repair, auto body, and they have some computer classes. But um, getting into any of these classes is really hard. And so they, when, they are so excited to be in beekeeping. And we've had women from all walks of life and all ages and all experiences. And they, you know, you know how it is with anybody who gets into bees, right? So you've got, they joke that they're a captive audience. So, but they, they get in there and they're so excited and they um, study hard and they read the books and they devour the magazines and they come with great questions. And so I, I just see a huge change, a huge, um, I mean, they just respond really well. I, I, I've never done anything where I have felt more appreciated in my life. Oh, I mean, wow. They love to see me walk through the door. You know, even if there there've been a few times when I've been on vacation for, you know, a couple of weeks, but I take a two week vacation. I'm not there for three weeks. And they're, they're almost kind of like Patty. They're like, you deserted us. We feel like you were never going to come back. I'm like, I told you I was going to be on vacation, <sighs> but they, but back to why they need volunteers is because, um, even though they have the experience beekeepers to answer questions and do the teaching. Um, so in the winter we stop coming. I just come like once a month to check in on them, mm -hmm. but they're, they're having class still. And so in the winter we try to, that's when we add people in January. And so the experience the certified beekeepers started teaching those. So they do the classroom work, which is great. It gives them, you know, um, experience and a job, but we found that they were not getting access to the apiary without volunteers. Aww. So, they needed us to get access, but also to sort of be the final word on things because of that authority thing. But we've had, so we had the first year we certified 16 beekeepers. The second year, five of those passed the journeyman test. And I don't know how your program is, your master beekeeper program is structured in Oregon, but um, in Georgia, journeyman is really difficult. It has like a 90% fail rate on wow. the outside. Yeah. I don't know what the, the graduation rate from the journey level is, but it takes a few years and it requires a lot of volunteer work. Yeah. A lot of so points. that's the big challenge for this going forward is how are they going to get all these public service credits, right? right. So they are, I'm telling you, these women are so creative. It's amazing. And they know what their resources are. And they are, there's one, I call, everybody has little nicknames and I call her MacGyver because she can just find a way to, you know, it was hard in the beginning to get used to, I can't just go in my basement and get something, you know, because they just, they don't have access to stuff and they don't have stuff. And I'm like, man, if we only had this and they can come up with, they have these little weird rubber band things that they use for dental floss. And they're like, oh, they stretch really, we could use those. And they just come up with really inventive ways to organize their materials and to do things. And, um, and that's really cool to be around. But has that been a challenge to bring in the tools that, you know, even just the basic tools that you'd need for working with bees? Well, we, we talked about that from the beginning, you know, we have to have hive tools and we have to have a lighter for the smokers. The lighter's the biggest deal actually, because lighters are completely contraband. Mm -hmm. So I, I carry the lighters in with me and I, I have a label maker that says beekeeping on it, but, and it really depends on who's, it's sort of like you go through airport security when you come in, you put your stuff on a belt and it kind of depends on the mood of the officer who's in charge. Cause sometimes he's a real stickler. Like sometimes I can bring in tape and sometimes I can't. And, but anything tape, really, yeah, anything extra you have to get permission for in writing two weeks in advance. So it requires oh. a lot of planning. Yeah. But they have the basics because that's the way it was set up, but we have the hive tools and like the uncapping knife and all that stuff is a locked closet that only one person in the building has a key to. Mm -hmm. So if he's out, we're kind of in trouble because we can't get our smokers and stuff. And then we have another locked area because stuff walks away. I mean, it just does. It's the way it is. Um, but we have another locked area with all the other equipment and the suits and everything. Yeah. But um, so, you know, if it's something, I can't bring in glass or metal. So one time I accidentally, I brought in a jar of creamed honey for them to taste. And I wasn't thinking that it was in a glass jar and the person at front didn't notice it. And then I realized later, cause my uh, Virginia had brought in some honey and squeeze bottles and we just kind of left it there. And we came the next week and I realized I left a glass jar there and it had disappeared. And I panicked. I was thinking about something getting sliced up and it being my fault or something. And I called the, my person, the deputy on care and treatment. And she goes, 
oh, you know, we've all done that. Don't worry about it. It probably Somebody probably just threw it away and nothing happened. But I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get in trouble and somebody's going to get hurt. But it wasn't a big deal. But it's just amazing how you just forget. Like I can't bring anything metal or glass. And there's like a lot of times I'll toss something in my bag and not realize until later I can't bring that in. It's metal or, and then just things like jars to feed or, um, you know, those mason jars or like if we do a mite roll. Um, they have to be plastic and it's hard to find that size jar in plastic. Actually, I've actually had to buy mayonnaise and like dump it out to get a right size jar, but that's a little bit of a challenge, but, um, and when we, so the, um, the Georgia Beekeeper Association has, um, a honey show every year for the state. And we have a special category where the prisons can compete just against the other prisons in the honey show. So we do get permission to bring in some glass queen line jars to fill for the honey show. We just have to bring it in and out mm-hmm. the same day. So we can get permission for things. And then they, they've prepared things for the, they have an artisan show at the um, February meeting. Cause it's not really honey season. So they, you know, can do baked goods and make candles. So we've brought in, we've gotten permission to bring in like a hot plate and um, glass and things that we normally can't bring in for those. And, mm-hmm. They love competing in those shows, and um, my ladies do very well. <laughs> ribbons, um, and a lot. I mean, the sad thing is, it's just hard to get participation from some of the prisons um, to to really go for all the categories. But um, yeah. they they really they're just so hungry for knowledge and for experience. And they it's been, um, yeah, it's been a really rewarding experience for me. And most of the time I feel like I'm just teaching the B class. Like I don't even realize I'm in a, you know, you just forget. I'm just like, I'm just hanging out with a bunch of women keeping bees that first year they got a, a swarm was on that compound and it wasn't there at one of their colonies, but it had um, clustered at the bottom of a chain link fence. And on the other side was, was where they can't go. (laughs) (laughs) So in talk about like not having your supplies. So we just ran around, got some, a box and um, some little pieces of cardboard. And I was like trying to put the, cause it was to the ground and I was trying to put the cardboard under the chain link fence, you know? And I was like, why is this chain link fence like down in the ground? And they're like, duh, Miss Mahood, we're in prison. Like they bury the fence or else you could just lift it up and run out. So I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot we were in prison. Um, I remember that day, one of the ladies was, it was a beautiful spring day, you know, like swarm season is like it is now. And she goes, I wish I could be like that little bee and just fly through that fence. It was- that is what I think about. Like it's the opportunity for them to work with a creature that gets to leave the walls. Mm -hmm. It's also the opportunity for them to care for something, you know, I mean, they love their bees and I try now. I mean, at this point we have, um, we have journeymen and we had two women pass the master test this year and and those public service credits, um, was a real challenge for that level, but we, um, they are so creative and they found ways. So the two of them passed that test. It was a really big deal, but I I mean, I guess it would take a, a incredible amount of determination to get over some of those hurdles and I would imagine coming out of prison a person's going to be faced with obstacle after obstacle after obstacle and I, I would think that that would be really detrimental to their spirit going right on. they're always going to have this label on them and it's always going to make it that much more difficult for them to achieve mm-hmm. even the most basic um, necessities for, for surviving. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think they do face, and and I've, I've seen a variety of personality types and motivations, but, um, one of, one of the women ladies, she's clearly very bright. And she said that this is the only thing she's, she's been in for maybe 14 years. It's the first thing she's done. That's given her, um, an intellectual challenge, like something to learn and to, mm-hmm. and she, um, just stu- all the studying. And they study like, I mean, like crazy, they are very well prepared. And we've had a few that have significant learning disabilities that I kind of didn't figure out until it was time to really hunker down and study for the test later in the season. Um, and I have a son with dyslexia. So I, I you know, I'm like, boy, I'm, you know, maybe we should, how about if I read this aloud to you and then they get it, you know? Mm-hmm. So we've had have some accommodations in that way. Yeah. I mean, I think that giving them something to care for, giving them a goal, 
we've had a couple of the younger beekeepers who were in trouble a lot before. And that, and my administrator there has said, you know, when they're in beekeeping, they, they keep their noses clean because they, they have something, they have a privilege and they want to keep it. And I think caring for the bees, I think being able to be outside and do something in nature is really valuable. And, um, and having to work together, I mean, they have to get along, you know, they, there've been a few spots where I felt like, you know, there was sort of some, some jealousy of some of the uh, women who were, who were sort of the leaders and, you know, that crops up like very easily. And it's just, you know, I'm always like, I'm Switzerland, you know, it is not my job, you know, they're sort of like storytelling on each other. And I'm like, it's, I don't, I'm a volunteer. This is not my job. I'm not turning anybody in. Mm -hmm. All she said, she said. So I just try to kind of try to get them to focus on the task at hand and not on what other people are doing, but it's hard. Have you ever I, felt fearful for your safety? I never have. Mm -mm. I mean, I think walking into a prison is intimidating. And sometimes when we bring guests in, they have that look on their eyes. Like, cause you know, you hear the gates go to chunk, you know, and you, this razor wire everywhere. And it can be kind of intimidating um, looking, but, and it's there, but I, I counted once there are 14 locked doors between the um, walking in and the apiary. So there's a lot of locking and unlocking doors. And we have to, when I first started, they gave the volunteers keys to get through most of the gates, but now we have to wait for people to unlock the gates and it just takes a while. And, and I think, you know, it's, when you're first there, it's a little, um, it's a little daunting, but once you get used to it you now and our, those beekeepers, you know, I know that they, they're so appreciative and they're, they're frequently will say things like, well, I don't want you to, you know, they, they worry about the program getting shut down, you know, when there's the, we've had like three wardens in the, four, this is our fifth year time that there's a lot of turnover and administration. Every time there's a little bit of a change in how things are done and things can get a lot stricter and, um, and you don't know if the new warden, you know, how they feel about the program, but there's always been a shortage of officers. They're always short staffed. It's a really poor paying job and it's kind of thankless and they have a hard time retaining those people. So there've been times when we haven't been able to have class cause they didn't have enough officers and where I've driven from Atlanta an hour and 10 minutes and had to turn around and come back. But, um, but not too often. Um, so it's, but it, but in terms of safety, no, I've always felt, um, perfectly safe. Yeah. What is the apiary itself like? It is, um, in a big open field. So they have no small hive beetles, which I keep telling them as a gift. Every once in a while, they're like, ah, and I'm like, this is not a problem. Trust me. So they have we started with six langs the first year and they got interested in some other types of hives. And my son had made um, a couple of top bar hives for a, his Eagle project when he was in high school and they went to a community garden, but one wasn't being used. So I asked if they would donate to the prison and they did. So they love their top bar hive. And then they had, they have a wood shop there. So they had their wood, a woodworking class make another top bar hive. And oh, it's really wow. painted it like a cow and they made these little cutout udders under it. It's absolutely adorable. <laughs> And a swarm That's moved such a cute idea. Oh, swarm yeah. moved in. Swarm moved into it, which was a gift. And um, I think last year, the most they had bees in were like, at one point we had 11 colonies. So That's it's, so yeah, and it's, it's like through a recreational field and then another at the end of another field. So it's pretty far away from where anyone goes. Um, we have some issues with people not really wanting to mow around the hives, but mm -hmm. um, they just, you know, pull up the grass around them. And they, we have a lot of talented artists in there and they've painted their hives really decorative, beautifully, decorated beautifully. And, Do you um, have any photographs of them? I have some, I will send you some. Um, okay. The first year we were allowed to take photos. And so I pretty well documented the whole year, but after that they passed some, um, some rule that said that no, nobody convicted of a um, violent crime could be their name or their photo portrayed in the media anywhere or social media. So that was kind of a bummer because they're all, they've all been convicted of violent things. So, so we can't have any of their pictures or their names, but I do have some pictures from the, especially if, and I can share them with you if their faces aren't clear. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, and especially of the hives, that's pretty easy. So. Yeah. I would love to see the, the hives. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there are some really talented women, and they they do a good job 
with that. And what yeah. about the honey that is harvested from the apiary? Do they get to enjoy it? So we're not allowed to sell honey. So you can't sell anything that inmates do. I know there's certain programs, but I don't really know how they work that. Um, so the first year we had like 100, believe it or not, first year from six packages over 100 pounds of honey. I think it was like 150 pounds. It's it's a great honey area. It's it's rural and they have a flow well into July. So wow. unlike Indiana, um, so they make a, quite a bit of honey. So they, you know, keeping the bees alive is their priority. So we leave a lot of honey on the hives, but um, we harvest honey. Well, first of all, I've told them that they can eat as much honey as they want in the classroom, but they can't take it out because you can't, you can't give anything just to one group of people. And you could mm -hmm. see where it could go bad, you know, because there's lots of, um, there's a whole economy of selling things um, in prison. And I, I had one young woman, she was just amazing. She was so bright and it's so sad. She was a 15 when she was convicted of armed robbery and given 15 years with no chance of parole. And um, I mean, she was like a baby, you know, and she's gotten her GED and she's, she, she had just had a pretty rough life outside, but she's got a great head on her shoulders. And she, she's one of that one that passed the journeyman. And she um, told me once, she's like, Oh, well, I have to work, Miss Mahood. I have lots of jobs because I can't, um, I don't have anybody on the outside sending me money. So I have to support myself. And I was like, well, I thought you couldn't get paid for your jobs. And she was like, no, but what you do is you just get jobs and you steal stuff at work and then you go back to the dorms and sell it. And that's how I make a living. But she was like, I mean, she had a work ethic, right? Like she, she was working to support herself and you don't, I mean, they just provide the bare necessities. So if you want any kind of extra food or extra sanitary products or anything, you have to buy them from the store. So they have a very limited supply of stuff that they can buy. And we looked into being able to sell honey at the store, but they, they like get all their goods from a certain distributor and it just didn't work out. So one year, we, so we always bottle honey and they designed one of the um, ladies designed a really cute little label and the honey, um, the warden gives it away and we give it to staff members mm -hmm. and then I tell them they can eat as much honey in the classroom as they want. So, but you know, they can't take it out because it'll start being sold and it'll shut the program down. So I did catch one woman stealing honey once and I had to say, you got to dump that out or you can't come back. And she chose to not come back. And she was really upset about it. She was like, I got stung 21 times. I deserve this honey. And I'm like, you can eat it in here, but you can't take it back. And I think they wanted to share it with their friends. But funny thing is they would, they would get like these, like, you know, drink cups, like these 10 ounce cups and fill them with honey and like drink it. And I'm like, you're going to make yourself <laughs> a lot of honey. That's so much. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been honey wasted before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I free base honey sometimes. I, <laughs> not like cups and cups of it, wow. but um, they like the wax. They chew the wax. And I know some of the wax has gotten stolen because people can use it in their hair. Mm -hmm. But I, I, now I take that home and store their wax in my freezer and bring it back when we we're going to make something. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it bums them out. They can't share it with their friends, but it is, you know, it is sort of the privilege of being in beekeeping. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I have, do you want to hear the heartwarming story? Yes. I have a clear jerker. So one of the ladies who, when she um, passed the journeyman, Jennifer Berry, who's, who's our amazing person at University of Georgia that does the te does all the testing, she had said, well, if you want to, if y'all want to go for, um, I guess it was when they, yeah, when they were going for journeyman, she said, if you, no, it was when they're going for master, if you all, um, if you all, you know, one of the PSCs, cause you have to get like five for journeyman, but you have to get 10 for master plus all these other things. And one of those things is that can qualify as writing a, um, getting an article published in a national publication. And Jennifer writes for Bee Culture. So she said, if y'all wanna write your stories about beekeeping behind bars, I'll print them in my column and that'll get you your certification, your, your PSC. So they did a great job writing their stories. And, um, and this one woman, um, wrote her story about, you know, how much she loved bees and beekeeping and, and what she was doing in prison. And she'd been in, I think for 12 years at that time. And, um, she is in prison because she believed that her ex-husband was molesting their six-year-old daughter. And she went, she like got her affairs in order and, you know, got everything tidied up and went to his place of work and caught him on the cell phone. And he came out and she shot him and killed him and just waited to be taken to prison. Oh. And, her daughter was six at the time. She hadn't seen her since then because his family 
you know, obviously you've got custody of her and um, her family hasn't been able to um, be a part of her life. So she, you know, she always put her name on the visitor list, hoping that she might make her name way there someday, but she hadn't seen her since she was six. So the article came out October 1st, it was 2018. And um, two weeks later, she gets a call out for visitation and it's her beautiful 18 year old daughter who's a beekeeper who reads Bee Culture magazine and read, she knew where her mom was and who she was, but it took that to, she was uh, in college in North Carolina. She drove down to see her for the first time in 12 years. Yeah. And for I'm this, speechless. I usually can't tell the story without crying, but I, <laughs> I practice a little but for her, like she's gotten her relationship with her daughter back through beekeeping. And I just think about that, the fact that they had something to talk about besides abuse and tragedy and, you know, all the things that in their shared history that they have this insect in common and what a gift that is for both of them. And they've been in touch. They've been, they've had their relationship back. So that was really what special. An unbelievable story. Yeah, yeah. And there's a um, there's a gentleman that I met um, at GBA who I had been in touch with. He we try to um, if any of the people who go through certification and get released and they want bees, GBA will pay for their first colony. They have to buy their That's own amazing. hive, but they'll get a package for them. So I was trying to arrange that for him, and um, and I just wanted to talk to him anyway because. I'd heard that he got out. He he went from a pretty high security prison to a, a county prison. He got was able to get transferred, um, and there he got certified at the first prison. At the second one, they have an agricultural program, but they never had bees, and so he initiated getting bees and starting a program there. And their farm there, he said, after having like three colonies of bees one season, their vegetable yield went up sevenfold, like it was huge. Whoa. So. It, prove to this whole agricultural community the value of bees, which is one thing that this program has done in all the prisons. Like all the all the prisoners talk about it because, oh, we have bees, that's weird or whatever, they see the suits. And so they're these incredible ambassadors. They've taught like the administration and the people on the grounds. But anyway, this gentleman um, got out and he decided he's starting a bee business this year. And so he's, he's you know, getting his stuff together. And I wanted to talk, I mean, that's like a huge success story, you know? Yeah. And I, about it. And he was telling me, he's like this Southern gentleman, this big, burly, very well-dressed, um, well-spoken gentleman and, um, very polite. And he's telling me a story. And he said that he, um, he, when he was teaching at Coweta, there was some, there was a gentleman in his class who was like a drug dealer who'd been in five or six times. And he's just a repeat offender. And, you know, he kind of, he was kind of, um, tough guy, you know, mm -hmm. And, but he was interested in bees, so he took the class, and they they got to know each other pretty well. When he left, when this guy got released, he said he got a letter from this guy, and he talked. He told him, and he started crying, just telling me about the letter. That this guy, like he said, you know, I've been in jail six times, and I, you know, have this problem with selling drugs, but that bees have given him a new perspective on life, and that his daughter, um, who I think was, I want to say nine or ten, some somewhere in that age range her new stepfather is a beekeeper. And so she's been learning beekeeping with her stepfather. And now her dad has this bond with his daughter and they can write about bees and talk about it. And he feels like he has something that he can do with her when he gets out and another avenue for him. And, and he said, you know, to have this big macho drug dealer, like tell him how much he changed his life was just an unbelievable experience for him. So there's lots of mentoring going on on different levels and mm -hmm. lots of lives being changed and, and um, relationships being repaired mm -hmm. and built, rebuilt. That's yeah. beautiful. All because of the bees, right? Yeah. So it's not, I mean, recidivism is one thing and we don't really have enough data to say, you know, we, we know that vocational training helps with recidivism, but mm -hmm. I look at it just more of a, contributing to their um, well-being, their emotional and social well-being while they're incarcerated. and That's so important. That seems like it's a piece that isn't addressed enough. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, I mean, it's, it's hard being in prison. And yeah, people have done horrible things to end up there. But one of the things I've learned is, 
you know, there are probably people walking around that we interact with every day that may have done just as hideous things, but they didn't get caught or for whatever reason, because I mean, these people are, are just lovely, kind hearted, generous, you know, sometimes just cooperative, amazing people. They're not they defined made, by their, their they made, conviction or their crimes. Yeah. I mean, they made mistakes, you know, but who among us hasn't? I mean, obviously some much more severe than others, mm -hmm. um, but I just, it's given me so much more compassion for people. And I think that just if everyone could volunteer in a prison, we would just have a different world because I think that they're, you know, I just, it's interesting talking to people about it because they're either like, wait, what? You, you teach beekeeping in a prison and they're fascinated or they're absolutely horrified. <laughs> but the people who are interested are, you know, like one time That's we had like that. working with bees though. I mean, you could tell somebody yeah. that you're a beekeeper yeah. and, and you can get these very polarized reactions. Exactly. It's the same thing. Yeah. But I put, we have that next door app that we use in our neighborhood. And um, one of my beekeepers works in the library at the prison. She's like, oh, we really need book donations. So I put one post out there and I'm telling you, I was overwhelmed with books. Like my husband was ready to kill me because at one point the entire dining room was filled with books. Like it took me several car loads from that one post and I've had to like turn people down, you know? So, and they're all like, I would like to help at a prison. You know, what can I do? So it's lovely to see that there is compassion and then it's really cool to be able to, you know, have these stories and, and maybe um, make people, think twice about how they feel about incarcerated people. Because the thing is, yeah, crimes need to be punished, but they are human beings. And there's a certain level of not just dignity that everyone should get or respect that everyone should get, but these people, if they're gonna get out and be walking among us, do you want someone who's just been browbeaten and emotionally abused for years and years? Or do you want someone that's had the opportunity for some personal growth that can come out a better person. And, and a lot of it is really up to the individuals. I had one day we we're having a conversation about privacy or something. And what this one woman said, well, I can, I never feel comfortable here. You never know when they're going to turn your bunk or pat you down. And it's very stressful. It's very stressful living in prison. This other woman goes, you know, Miss Ma, I just want to tell you that I did something really, really bad. And I'm here to, to do my time and to pay my debt to society and I deserve to be here. And while I'm here, I am taking advantage of every educational opportunity I can get. And I'm trying to better myself. I'm going to meetings and doing programs. And 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 I, I feel okay being here. Like I think I think I'm treated okay. And it was just interesting. And that's I mean, that's how everyone is in the world, right? You meet people who are super privileged and they're like negative and down on everything. And then you meet people who don't have much who are happy and feel good about what they have. So mm -hmm. People in prison are just people, you know, they're just people. It's the same kind of people you run into out here. At least I realize that there's a whole segment that have some mental illness and that's probably why they're in them. I don't work with those people, so I can't address that. And that's a whole nother problem. Yeah. But, um, but in general, you know, the incarcerated people are people and they have the same needs and desires and um, that we have. You can't just, you can't stop being a human being for five or 10 or 20 or two years, you know, you, mm -hmm. so I feel like any kind of um, vocational opportunities they have or educational at all, or just opportunities for growth that, that are going to make them better citizens when they get out. Wow. Um, I think people will be so, so touched when they hear these stories and hopefully inspired to get involved if their states don't have programs like this already then perhaps to get the ball rolling on, yep. on, on doing a, a program like that. A local club even, or a state club. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk to them about our experience. But I mean, we just kind of made it up as we went along and, and it was, and it's been great. So all it takes is some time and some willingness. It is definitely the most rewarding work I've ever done. Um, it really, really is. So I think that if you have the opportunity to give in that way, I, I highly recommend it. To connect with Julia and read more about her work, visit mapmydca.com. Thank you all for listening. I hope you're staying safe and are having a stellar bee season. Until next time, may the buzz be with you.
Beekeeper Confidential is a Waggle Works production and is written and produced by Mandy Shaw.